Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Anand. I am a UX designer at Cucumber Town. We are a recipe blogging platform where you could post awesome recipes. So those of you who are into cooking and that sort of stuff should definitely check it out. So uh, designing at uh, breakneck speed. Uh, as a designer, when I read it, uh, you know, it sounds very oxymoronic, right? So we, as a group of professionals, are institutionalized to think the top-down view, a holistic view of design where you are advised to spend ample time understanding the needs of the user, create the perfect uh, wireframe and informa information architecture before you actually delve down into detailing and designing your product. But uh, unfortunately, in a fast-paced startup culture or a, a small product uh, setup where time and the money is kind of like burning every second, you, you probably don't have the luxury to spend a lot of time Understanding your, uh, you know, your users and the and the and and building the information architecture up front. You probably have a rough picture of what you're going to build, but immediately you need to start showing results uh, to the people concerned and stakeholders. So, typically, designers who come from fresh, I mean, design institutes, young designers, uh, you know, who I've worked with, find this this kind of situation very uh, very difficult to comprehend and uh, adjust to. So, what is it like? Uh, dealing with such a situation, right? So, I mean, in short, it might sound initially something like this, right? So, you, this is your ideology of design, a good design, how it should be, but there is a reality that startups and small product cultures thrives on the push culture. So, you have to push something out to the market, see the traction, see the reaction from your audience, and then improvise and build on top of it. So, uh, so this is about delivering, the, the speed of delivery, and then how quickly you are reacting to, uh, you know, the situation. So we thrive on making prototypes, right? So everybody wants to make the 100% perfect prototype beforehand and then go into detailing of each component, which is never going to happen in a startup because, uh, you know, requirements keep changing. You will have a finite set of requirements when you start up with, and then suddenly, uh, you know, next investor meet will have a new suggestion and new direction that the product might want to take into. So uh, your core idea might take some twists and turns and you might probably have to revisit the prototype that you have made. And uh, so the idea here is to like kind of have an idea of what you're going to build, a rough idea of what you're going to make, and don't try to make it 100% perfect. Always leave room for improvement out there. So uh, again, there is a question of what is an ideal prototype? What can I actually build which is the perfect solution for everyone to understand? The short answer to that is there is no perfect solution. Early on when, uh, when you start on a product in its, in, in its very early stage, you typically will have this request from your product manager or uh, the scrum master, right? I have an investor meeting coming up, you know, why don't you, uh, we are building this feature, why don't you just come up with a mock or a prototype that I can show it to him. Now, unfortunately, not all solutions can be conceived in a prototype at that stage because as a designer, you yourself have no idea of what you're going to build. So how are you going to, you know, kind of visualize that in a prototype and then show it to somebody in a high fidelity sense, right? So that will lead into unnecessary discussions, right? I didn't like the color. I don't, I mean, I don't think the labeling is not right, the right one. So, uh, you know, this is an example of how, uh, you know, I don't know the picture is right, but this was at Yahoo when I was working there. You know, early stage uh, in, a, in a project, we didn't even have a proper architecture diagram in front of us. But since we were working at Yahoo, there were lots of components that were, pre-built and the initial stage of the product was about you know connecting those pieces together and kind of uh, you know build and work around and improvise those features and add more features into it so we actually we devised a nice way of you know kind of printing out uh, uh, or il illustrating paper diagrams and then kind of connecting them into you know different modules with paper uh, connections so the idea with this was you know since since we were all working in one team you know everybody this is extremely visual so it's not constrained into a, you know actual like wireframe which has to have uh, it has to be referenced every day on a computer right so whatever you do the prototype the idea has to be communicated upfront and whatever method that you choose you choose make sure it is effective so again uh, the early case of you know the wireframe or mock up syndrome you don't really have to make every design into a, a mock up initially the key is here, key here is to uh, communicate the idea again. So in this case, you know, there was a constant uh, interface difference 
between a mobile interface and a, on, I mean, online and off, uh, uh, offline experience, right? How are you going to show that you are uh, five, in, in your five-minute investor meeting through mockups, right? So you could always uh, rely upon making storyboards where the experience is captured, and in five minutes, you everybody in the in, in, in the room kind of gets the idea of okay, hey, this is what these guys are going to build, and uh, you know, kind of get the buy-in or get the make constructive criticisms and discussions happen around it, happening around it. Now. Once you start moving into making wireframes, quality time spent on a good wireframing. I have seen people making, hey, this is just a wireframe. My final design is going to be like, you know, my visual design is going to change things. Often people underst underestimate the effort that it takes to make pixel perfect, you know, visual designs and, you know, coding for that matter. So any time that you spend on making your initial designs, uh, you know, kind of in proper layouts, proper structure, is actually an add-on bonus in your incremental product development life cycle. So make sure the prototypes are dealt with equal seriousness. You may not get the time to do the actual visual design in the end. Ha. Documentation. So, uh, you know, people who have worked with large organizations often complains that, you know, in startups we don't have documentation. True, we don't have time to document. So, but even if I document, nobody will have the time to read it. So, uh, we improvise. What do we do? We improvise. So this is a case where uh, we were building a mobile app at uh, Cucumber Town, and the entire design was done probably in half an hour, the initial designs. So uh, as I was working on Illustrator, and we started taking screen captures of uh, each screen as I was building, and then started posting them into HipChat to my team. So uh, the interesting case is I work out of Chennai from my home, and the team sits here in Bangalore. So we use HipChat a lot to communicate. So since they could really see the rendering over there uh, on HipChat's uh, preview, we started uh, debating and discussing over it. And then once it was, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, approved, a certain flow was approved, we kind of moved it to do Evernote. And then once we voted up and then discussed it further and then moved into a Trello card. And see, these kind of collaborative tools are your, dis are, are your documentation tool when you're actually working in a very fast-paced, uh, you know, environment. So uh, I think the next point, I think Chris might talk to you about uh, a little bit more detail, I hope, when you are actually discussing it. Uh, this is uh, one of the feedbacks that I got from him when he was reviewing one of our designs, that you, know, you have to make sure you document your components really well. Don't get into atomic details of you know, how my H1 tag is going to be, how the spacing between the H1 and the next beta paragraph is going to be. That's a pointless exercise, because that's the kind of documentation which people will never going to, uh, never going to read. So, Try make sure make so why is it that Bootstrap is so popular among developers, right? Because it's I just need to give a developer a doodle of this is how the components are going to be. They can just pick it up from Bootstrap and create a decent enough design with that. So think of your design documentation in that sense. Develop your components first. Make sure that things doesn't move around or change uh, quite a lot. Uh, uh, you know, once you finalize on those elements. Um, so again, uh, often in this, in this kind of you know, agile environment where you, know, you are like really close and work in, work in a very uh, pressurized situation, getting feedback from real feedback from people and getting constructive feed, uh, criticism is quite tough. So, um, but it is really important to have your ideas bounced off against uh, a neutral audience and to get it validated. So we use different techniques. Uh, being, a, being in the consumer segment, we post a lot into Reddit groups where uh, you know our core ideas, some of these snippets of what we are building, will be uh, exposed to them, uh, and then we track their feedbacks through that, and then kind of improvise and build. This has uh, this has helped us a lot in terms of getting feedback. Now, uh, Raj Gobal talked about data-driven design, which is really important. But there are cases where data can only exist when you have a design or a certain pattern. But when you don't have a pattern, we, you, you probably have to improvise and have to uh, go with your intuitions and uh, you know, see where it goes, where it leads you. So um, always go and approach UX communities and kind of get their uh, feedback on certain things before you go with your intuitions, because everybody in the design community have, might have validated your intuitions at some point or the other. Uh, when you get feedbacks, create a parking lot of all your ideas and uh, if not today, you probably will have to go and revisit them at a later stage. Now, uh, again, this is a question of 
uh, you know, how focused you are, and in, when you are working in that kind of a focus, churning, uh, churning, churning screens, and uh, you know, developing at a very day-to-day -day basis, you often tend to look into uh, your designs in a very page-based or even a component-based manner. So uh, you don't have to look uh, to understand this point. You don't have to look any further. This is Facebook's, uh, you know, newsfeed versus Facebook's, uh, you know, profile page. You could see the stark difference in style there, but you know. I don't think people really complain about it, but as designers, this is probably something that could catch our eye because this was developed probably as two different kind of ideas. And for each, the, we all know the, how, how the news, the, the timeline has changed into this. So probably elements of the timeline might might be still uh, remaining there in that design. So uh, taking a look back and see if your design patterns and minute details of your designs are followed through the entire site is also very important. Uh, so. As a designer, personally, I would also advise everybody to be hands-on when you are doing, develop, uh, doing design, not just interaction design, because especially in startup environments, you have to be a visual designer, you have to be an interaction designer, you have to be a, a you know, front-end engineer to some sense, because uh, that's what gives you a lot of control over your des design, right? If there is a feedback on a small font size or an alignment or something that you, you get from somebody, you, it is not something that should take you a day to fix. You should be able to have your own git check-in and should be able to make it make that correction quickly and uh, you know get it out of your system so to summarize these are the things that we need to remember it's a participatory game everybody ha can design so small startups everybody has to do some has to play some sort of designer role so being a designer in a team uh, you should actually be the enabler of the, those things your competence should enable a normal developer to take up your doodle and build a competent or a, or an admin system with that so that's you shouldn't be a bottleneck at that stage. Uh, establish the idea first, the the storyboard uh, example that I have given. Prototyping early and often, and being hands-on. Uh, the last point. So, yeah, this is to summarize the points in slightly philosophical way. So uh, that's it. Questions. Hi. Yeah, that was a nice talk. Uh, what about a no chrome flat design? Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, about flat designs. Yeah, so uh, that is something that I had it in my notes, but then it was extremely subjective way of looking at things. So then I thought I would remove it. So the idea was that, you know, when you go into documentation and detailing, a small line or a drop shadow or a color that you are actually add on a, on a design is actually going to make, uh, to, uh, you know, a small change to that is not a small change eventually in the end because it gets added up. There are different components that might get affected to that. So that's kind of uh, goes back to the perfect wireframe idea where, you know, you make that wireframe perfect uh, with the minimal elements uh, and then that would eventually adding very minimal stylist, styling element to that would eventually build up your uh, final uh, visual feel, uh, look and feel. So that's where I think the flat design scheme that uh, that is a kind of a trend these days uh, uh, can come to a lot of, uh, you know, importance these days. You uh, talked about uh, building a visual design uh, dictionary or kind of an encyclopedia, and you showed the example of peer. Um, any more comments on that? Um, any um, ways you recommend would be uh, the right way to do it, or any things that you've had good success with in doing that? Uh, so, honestly, I, I discovered Peer very recently, and uh, so the small example is that you know when you start building components, uh, you know the components eventually improvise, right? So, take the case of Facebook's uh, like box, right? It was not the like box when it started, but now it has reached to a maturity where Facebook has to use the same like box uh, everywhere across wherever that similar module uh, appears. So over the time, uh, you you evolve a component, and at that stage, you have to realize that this component, this is a potential component that you are building, and then probably try to sit with your uh, you know lead front end engineer to make it an independent piece, 
and have it documented uh, like the way Bootstrap does, right? All you need is a master Bootstrap file, and you just call the component, and anybody can build that component in no time. So that's what I meant uh, by looking at. So peer is probably something which you, as a designer, can start off, right? You don't need the developer's assistance there. You have your HTML file, you try to make it, and then probably give it to a developer to do add, add the necessary component, component structure to it, and take it forward. Just a quick follow-up. Nobody else is. Um, what about uh, things like uh, style tiles and um, any um, any feedback on that? Have you ever used those things? Uh, style style guide. style tiles. Uh, it's a uh, where you take uh, just a small piece of uh, the UI and kind of put your style in there, just as a visual reference. Yeah. Uh, while showing showing off your design. Um, you mean say uh, sort of before you actually start off the design? Yeah. We used to do mood boards. Uh, okay. If you if that's what you meant. Uh, so to basically show people that you know this is how eventually the the, the site would be built build up to, but um, if that's the case, mood boards are often a, not a meaningful exercise in my opinion because uh, very good chance that you know you, you drift away a lot from the initial mood board pattern that uh, you conceived, um, and if you're looking at having the basic theme structure, uh, you could use maybe if you're if you're desired on the base uh, you know. Framework that you are building upon, uh, you know, I, in in Cucumberton we have a customized Bootstrap framework where uh, we created our own theme on top of the basic Bootstrap framework, and that is being used as a reference. So I just wanted to check: so you are a designer. Yeah. Uh, do you actually spend a lot of time coding CSS? Uh, and uh, plus, you also mentioned the Bootstrap theme just now. Is that completely enough? Can you just make the Bootstrap theme and leave it at that and? Think can the developers just use that? Uh, to a lot of extent, I mean, once the design reaches a certain maturity in terms of the correct layouts and stuff like that, uh, for doing a small uh, improvisation to a, let's say, a pop-up component, right? All I need to tell the user, uh, the my developer, is to like you know refer to those components and you know kind of build it. Whatever little polish it might need afterwards, it is because I have worked on those codes. It's easy for me to just clean up and you know push it. So uh, yeah, other designer, I work extensively, extensively on coding. Thank you.